Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. Our guest today is the internationally renowned Buddhist meditation teacher and best-selling author Sharon Salzberg. Sharon co-founded the Insight Meditation Society with Jack Cornfield and Joseph Goldstein. She's been leading meditation retreats around the world for over three decades and in many ways she has become the leading advocate for the practice of metta or loving-kindness meditation in the West. Her books include Loving Kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness, a Heart as Wide as the World, The Power of Meditation, a 28-day program, Real Happiness at Work and Room to Breathe, and At Home Meditation Retreat. She's here to talk to us today about Loving Kindness Meditation and a new online initiative she's recently started called The Boundless Heart and a book that's coming out in the new year uh, called Real Love. Hello, Sharon. Welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Thank you so much. Okay, well, just let's dive in, Sharon. What first sparked your interest in meditation all those years ago? (laughs) That was a long time ago. Um, I was a a university student, and I took a course in Asian philosophy. And I was going to a school where um, they had an independent study program. And if you created a project that they liked, you could go off for, say, a year and get full school credit for that. So. I was very struck in the Asian philosophy course by the idea of meditation, that there was actually something you could do with your mind in a practical, direct way that could make you happier. And I was pretty unhappy. Uh, I was 18 years old, and um, I created a project. I went to the the administrators, and I said, I want to go to India and study meditation. So they said, okay. Brilliant. (laughs) And I went off. I went off in 1970 with you know, my scholarships and student loans and uh, the blessing of the university, and I went off to India. Can you actually remember the first time you ever meditated? Definitely. Uh, I wandered around India a bit looking for, you know, it was a very precise sort of situation I wanted. I wasn't really interested in becoming a Buddhist per se or rejecting anything else. I wanted to know the, the real practicalities of how to do it, you know. Yeah. Uh, what are the tools? What are the techniques? How do I use them? And uh, finally, I heard about SN Goenka, who was just in India, uh, out of Burma, you know, very recently, and who was leading these intensive 10 day immersion retreats, which were exactly that. They were using the methods and the techniques um, within the context of the Buddhist teaching, but it wasn't a question of becoming a Buddhist or adopting a dogma or anything. It was really your own work, you know, in using those techniques. So I entered uh, my first meditation retreat in Bodh Gaya, India, uh, January 7th, 1971. So that was when I began. Okay. And would, was loving kindness a component of that very first experience? Uh, it was really a mindfulness retreat. It was an insight meditation retreat. Uh, Goenkaji led a little bit of loving kindness right toward the end of it. So it was almost a kind of ceremonial way of saying goodbye. But that was the first time I heard of loving kindness meditation. I went, ooh, what's that? (laughs) So you wouldn't say then loving kindness is necessarily an an integral part to all aspects of meditation practice? No, I mean, I I think there's a difference between the quality and the method. You know, I think the quality is an integral part of all aspects of meditation. I think... Even if it's not named, even if we're not conscious of it, we are cultivating certainly a kind of self-compassion yeah. in the ordinary course of, say, doing mindfulness as we're even developing concentration, you know, where we have an object of meditation, an object of awareness, and we settle our attention there, and then our minds wander and we have to bring it back, and then our minds wander and we have to bring it back. Yeah. I think the best way to accomplish that is through self-compassion. If every time your mind wanders, you judge yourself and berate yourself and put yourself down, it's not an easy road, you know? Yeah, so it's about not beating yourself up when you just go off. That's right, and very gently letting go and with kindness towards yourself starting over. And 
So that's a sneaky kind of loving kindness, even if you don't understand that it's loving kindness. So I think the quality of loving kindness is woven throughout the meditative forms. There is a specific method which is devoted or dedicated to the deepening of loving kindness. And that's what I wanted to learn. You know, yeah. I first heard about it and I thought, oh, you know, I want that. And, but it was only um, in 1985 I went to Burma and I did an intensive three-month period of loving kindness as a method of meditation and and then brought it back to the States. Okay, well, we can maybe unpack that a little bit later, uh, Sharon. But just to start off with, what does the the term metta or its translation, loving kindness, actually mean? Is it something that we can pin down in, in, in English? It's a little difficult. Um, loving kindness is the common translation. It's the one we all use. My concern with the term is that it's such an odd sort of term, you know. Yeah. You may not be, say, in a, a village and hear the conversation at the nearby table center on loving kindness. You know, if you're sitting in a cafe. Yeah. But And I'm afraid that makes the quality itself seem somewhat removed from day-to-day -day life, whereas really it, it's a, a big part of everyday life. Um, another translation is love, but that's an extremely complex notion. We mean so many different things. Is it similar to the um, Christian, what's it called? I, I don't know how you pronounce this. Ag agape, yeah? Agape, yes, it is similar to that. So that's like universal love. It's like a universal love, although it's also very, in the Buddhist tradition, in the practice of loving kindness, we begin with the offering of loving kindness to ourselves. Yeah. So it's not like we're denying ourselves for the sake of this kind of universal love, but we understand that loving ourselves is like the foundation. Okay. And how does it differ, if at all, to compassion? The, the literal translation of metta, M-E-T-T-A, is the Pali, uh, which is the language of the original Buddhist text, is friendship. So it means developing an art, the art of friendship toward ourselves and toward all of life. So I actually tend to use the word connection um, because to have loving kindness for someone doesn't mean you like them necessarily. Yeah. And it certainly doesn't mean you're going to invite them home for dinner, you know, or have anything to do with them. Um, it's not a decision about behavior. You know, that decision about behavior has a lot of other elements in it, like discernment and understanding and prior experience and so on. But it's a, it's a hard space of inclusion and wishing someone could be happy and in some cases happier. But one of the bases for that sense of connection is the understanding or the belief that all beings want to be happy. Everybody actually wants to be happy. And we so often don't have a clue as to where real happiness will come from. You know, not just the superficial happiness of getting what we want, but a more abiding happiness of feeling a sense of belonging, feeling a sense of being at home somewhere in this world. We all want that. And we're given so many myths and lies and so many things we're told about where happiness is to be found. Like, you know, we're told all kinds of things about strength, that if you're vengeful, you'll be strong. If you're kind, you'll be weak. But is that true? When we really look, you know, so it's out of ignorance that we make so many mistakes that cause so much suffering. But that's the kind of the basis of loving kindness is recognizing everybody wants to be happy. Compassion is a very similar state, but also a little distinct in that compassion is a response to sensing suffering. Um, it's, it's called a movement of the heart. It, it's a movement toward that suffering to see if we can be of help. So it's, it's actually like kind of a quickening or a quivering in our hearts as we move toward to see if we can be of help. And this, by the way, is distinct from moving into the suffering to burn up, you know, <laughs> and be destroyed. We move toward to see if we can be of help. So it's not that um, everybody's suffering in the same measure, because clearly that's not true. So it's, it's in a way, it's, 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 is it about taking risks? You talk about strength. It's almost like you're saying that he's having the strength to be vulnerable in a sense. Yes, and what I was about to say is that since it's clear that we 
do not all share the same measure of pain. Uh, one of the, just as seeing everybody wants to be happy as a basis for loving kindness, sensing everyone's vulnerability is a basis for compassion. Even if it looks like your life is fine, life is so unsteady, it's so uncertain, and so we have a kind of compassion. But also, perhaps especially in the West, a lot of people still view being kind to oneself as being some, in some way self-indulgent or kind to others as being uh, weak. What, what, what's going on there? Absolutely true. <laughs> uh, I mean, I face that a lot. I hear that question or that, you know, counterpoint a lot. I think it's just conditioning. It's, um, it's a strong belief system. I think in the U.S., I'd, you know, I'd say it has a lot to do with the kind of conditioning about always being in control. You should always be in control of everything. And, you know, and it's, uh, because it's so untrue that we're in control. It's yeah. pretty risky business to <laughs> to count on that. Yeah, and uh, and again, similarly, we often I think there's often this this idea that such things are as much part of us as the colour of our eyes. That we are somehow hardwired that way. I've met, for example, I've met several meditators who say for, they they can't they can't get on with loving kindness meditation. Do you think that's part of the issue in some way, that the idea of training yourself to be more loving or more kind comes across as odd in some way to many people? Yes, I mean, I think it, it takes, um, well, of course, you know, there are many styles and there are many approaches to anything. And so, uh, and you don't have to force yourself to do something you don't feel good about, you know. I mean, there are a million ways of deepening qualities like loving kindness and compassion, but I also think a lot of people um, misunderstand the process. They think they're going to become hypocritical or they're going to force themselves to pretend they feel something they don't feel. Or um, I have a friend who was my friend. The first book I wrote was called Loving Kindness. And I have a friend who told me he was reading it on the New York City subway system, you know, riding to work. And he was so embarrassed to be seen reading a book called Loving Kindness that just to hide the cover so nobody would see what he was reading. And I thought, my God, it's like pornography or something. You know, how weird is that? Um, but I understand that because we do tend to have a conditioning that love or loving kindness is weak, it's sentimental, it's phony, it's hypocritical, all kinds of things. So you have to uh, be working in, in a spirit of experimentation, yeah. not coercion. You're not forcing yourself to feel anything. You're doing this really kind of wild experiment in paying attention differently. So when I teach loving kindness, I, I, I say this is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. Uh, sometimes it's an emotion, of course, but it doesn't have to be, you know, and so you don't have to drive yourself crazy trying to feel something. It could be a worldview. It could be a shift in how you pay attention. It could be listening to somebody instead of kind of ignoring them. Um, it's a shift in how we pay attention. If you think about how many shops we go into and there's that shopkeeper, maybe one we go, we're kind of familiar with even, and we don't really look at them. We sort of look through them. They're, they're quite objectified for us, like a piece of furniture. And then the question is, what happens when you actually look at them? And you take them in as a human being who wants to be happy just as you do. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, um, one of the, expressions that I really like that you use I think on a regular basis you talk about about it as being a stretch yeah I, mean, I do I do like that that way of describing it it's it's in just this spirit so for example if if you're the kind of person who at the end of the day you look back at yourself almost as though to evaluate yourself through the day and if you're the kind of person who pretty well only recalls the mistakes you made and what you didn't do perfectly and what you could have done better uh, so much so that your whole sense of who you are and all that you'll ever be just collapses around this stupid comment you made at a lunchtime meeting, for example. The stretch is almost like asking yourself, anything else happened today? Yes, I made mistakes. You're not denying it. You're not pretending otherwise. But not only mistakes, right? The day wasn't like 100% in that way. Let's give a little air time. You know, to the good within me, the good I did, the ways I tried. To, you know, so that's a stretch for most people. You're going to 
if you're in the habit of only recollecting pretty well what went wrong. And, you know, what about going into that shop and making a point of looking at that shopkeeper and listening to them as a human being, even if you're not in the habit? You know, so it's stepping out of familiar zones of habit and just seeing what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a situation not too long ago, Shannon. I was just walking through walking home from the shops and I was um, I was thinking about something really pleasant and, and had a smile on my face and this guy walked past and he said he said what the what the fuck are you looking at and uh, and, and and I could just feel my myself get really defensive at first but then I, then I thought to myself uh, well what's going on in his head to actually respond like that to someone smiling at him and you know and and immediately so I could I got emotionally hijacked myself at first, but then I was immediately just by seeing him in that wider perspective, you know, then I was able to enter into that sort of more kind way of thinking about him. But uh, it's it, it, you know we we come across these situations all the time in our lives, really, don't we? When you think about it, we do. <laughs> anyway, well, just for any um, listeners that are fairly new to meditation and and don't have experience of of a, a a practice within their meditation. Could you give them a, something to, to start them off with, maybe? You mean, you mean any meditation or loving kindness in particular? Loving kindness. Uh, so with loving kindness, we would choose maybe three or four phrases, and that becomes the home base for our attention, the repetition of those phrases. So phrases starting with oneself would be things like, may I be happy, may I be peaceful. The idea of the the feeling tone is gift giving we're offering, you know, and uh, it's not begging or imploring, you know, but it's like somebody said to me, one of my friends, it's like you hand someone a birthday card and you say, may you have a happy birthday. May you have a great year. It's like that, you know, but we begin with ourselves. So uh, even if it's two phrases, that would be fine. We just gently repeat them over and over again with enough space and enough silence so that it's a rhythm that's pleasing. Does you know what I mean? I really, you know, like, yeah. like that. Um, and it doesn't have to be prescriptive. It can be, it can be something that you're comfortable with. It relates to your own experience. Yes. And it's also, it needs to be very general because we're going to try to use the same phrases as we move to others. Okay. You know, so it can't be like, may I have a great parking spot tomorrow <laughs> so that I can get to the theater on time, you know? Because then you're going to turn to a friend, you're going to turn to that shopkeeper in your mind, you're going to, you know. Uh, so that's why it tends to be things like, may I be happy, may I be peaceful, uh, may I be at ease with whatever comes my way in life. Or, you know, it's, it's a little like poetry. It has to be a phrase that suits you, you know. So spend a little time choosing three or four phrases and they won't be perfect, but I usually say choose good enough phrases and then. Uh, you settle your attention on the repetition of those phrases uh, over and over again. You don't have to try to force a feeling or an emotion. The power of the practice is in the complete wholehearted presence behind one phrase at a time. And then your mind will wander. It won't be 10,000 phrases before your attention wanders. It probably won't be five phrases before your attention wanders. And you'll be lost in a fantasy or... Uh, you'll fall asleep or something will happen. And then comes the magic moment in any technique, which is the moment when you emerge, when you realize, oh, it's been quite some time since I last was sort of doing the phrases or feeling the breath or whatever. And that's the moment where we practice gently letting go and with kindness toward ourselves, returning our attention to the object we have chosen. You know, so we let go, we come back, we let go, we come back. And, you know, in loving kindness, we begin with offering loving kindness to ourselves. Then maybe you choose a friend and you offer loving kindness to the friend. So there's a whole systematic way. There's a sequence yeah. uh, that you follow depending on how much time you have and so on. And then you can often go through a sort of in incremental process where you, you engage with people that you might be indifferent to. Like the example, someone that that's, you know, perhaps serves you in your local supermarket that you are not very familiar with. Or, or that, and then sometimes people who might push your buttons a little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the classical sequence, which 
you certainly may not do in its entirety in one session, but over time, the classical sequences yourself, a benefactor that someone who's helped you or maybe mentored you, maybe you've never met them, they've inspired you from afar. The texts say this is the one who, when you think of them, you smile. You're just kind of glad for their existence. So it could be a child, you know, yeah. uh, could be a pet even. Um, and then we move on from the benefactor to a friend. Then we move on to that kind of neutral person, like the shopkeeper. Yeah. You may not know their name, but you could just get a feeling for them. And, uh, and then someone you have a little bit of difficulty with. Uh, and then all beings everywhere, all of life. So in any one session, that's way too much. So uh, it may be that we usually say the bookends are starting with yourself and ending in that kind of global, universal extension of loving kindness. And what you do in the middle portion depends on how much time you have. It depends on what's happening in your day. You know, maybe you have a friend who's uh, getting an award today. You want to be sure to include them. Or maybe you're going to that very shop that uh, the shopkeeper you've been thinking about, you know, every day and meditating with uh, in your mind. Maybe you're going there, so you want to include them, something like that. So with someone that you perhaps have a rather rigid archetypal view of, this then presumably can help you to view this person in a slightly more rounded way without necessarily forcing yourself to, as you say, like that person or approve of their of all their actions? Yeah, I mean, it's not that we never have a response to someone or make choices. We do make choices, you know. Yeah, I'm going to lend you money. No, I'm not going to lend you money. Or, yeah, I'm going to bring you home. No, I'm not bringing you home. Or, uh, But mostly our decisions, our choices are based on assumption, which we're not even noticing what other people have taught us, you know, not something we discover for ourselves. If you just think about how many conversations we have where we're not really listening, where we're thinking about the email or we need to write or who else we'd rather be talking to. And so how do we really feel who this person is, you know, or, or see them more accurately? We have to pay attention, you know, which usually means gathering our fragmented awareness and actually arriving there. Yeah. And this is obviously very relevant today in the in the increasingly polarized political climate. I'm, le I'm thinking at least in the US and the UK with, with your, your election and, and Brexit in the UK. I've heard, for example, now in the US, one's political affiliation has become a, a greater prejudicial factor than race. That it's it, it was quite common for, for a couple in the 60s who were, say, a Republican and a Democrat to marry. Now it's much less so. So something like this could be really helpful if it was taken up by more people. It's true. Well, yesterday uh, was uh, Thanksgiving, you know, the holiday that we celebrate with enormous meals and so on. And yeah. Usually families coming together. And it was sort of a it was an interesting and, and kind of humorous speculation, like, what were those conversations going to be like if you had people of differing? I don't know yet. I, I mean, I, I was at one and everybody was of a similar persuasion. So it would be interesting to hear from people. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a big challenge for us ahead, isn't it? But um, I'm glad there's people like you around that are encouraging us to see people in a more rounded um, way. Anyway, yeah. Your book, um, Loving Kindness, was published over 20 years ago. Is there anything in it that you would change now if you were to rewrite it? It's very funny because uh, I have a book coming out in June uh, called Real Love, and people ask me, is it is it the rewritten version of <laughs> Loving Kindness? It's not, but I have learned something in 20 years, I hope, uh, including... It's a lot more about manifestation, you know, how does how do these qualities loving kindness is really a manual for learning that technique and it's very classical in a lot of ways, very Buddhist and uh although hopefully relevant. And um this uh you know what I teach so much now, I either teach intensive courses in that technique or I, I teach us how to Consider some of the questions you've been asking, you know, like, what does loving kindness look like when you uh, really disagree with somebody and you know you're going to fight 
for what you believe is right. Yeah. Just, you know, how do you find a balance between compassion for yourself and compassion for someone else? And, and also increasingly relevant in today's world. Um, and the people I tend to work with, you know, how do you balance compassion with realizing I can't fix it? You know, I can't. I'm not in control of the universe, sadly enough, and I can't just say, okay, it's all going my way, you know. Um, you know, you, you have a pretty good insight maybe into a friend and what they should do to not suffer so much, and you cannot make them do it. You just can't. You know, life isn't like that. You can be there, you can be present, you can try, you can communicate, but you're never going to be in control. So those are fascinating questions, you know, that we face in everyday life. And that's more what I, you know, write about or teach about now. And then you started another thing fairly recently, an online initiative called The Boundless Heart. I did that. Uh, it's still going on, actually. I'm doing that in conjunction with Tricycle Magazine. Um, because, uh, you know, we just live in a time where the availability of technology means that uh, two things can happen. Uh, you can have accessibility to teachings and methods without, you know, schlepping off to India or something like that. Yeah. I went to India when I was 18, as I said. And I I grew up in the East Coast in, in uh, the U.S. I'd never even been to California when I went to India. You know, and you sort of had to do it then. I did it too. Yeah, you know, so it's like, it's outrageous. and uh, But not everyone can do that. And so I'm like so happy that there are these means of, of having teachings. And the second thing that's really important is the community. You know, like communities get created of, supportive people and like-minded people through these kinds of programs. And if you either feel very alone wherever you're living or it's just a great support to have another community, even if it's online. Yeah. And this, this program is very international. So people are really finding each other. Okay. Well, uh, I wish you the best of luck with that. Um, what's your understanding of the middle way, um, Sharon, in, in relation to what we've been talking about today? Well, the middle way is really everything, you know, like, uh, I mean, it's, of course, most classically known as, as the middle way between um, overindulgence on the one hand and over asceticism on the other, and, and the example of the Buddha's own life. But it's also, I think, the middle way between different um, extreme views, you know, one extreme view around uh, there being something substantial somewhere we can find that we can cling to that will keep us safe and won't ever change. And the other extreme view being kind of nihilism, you know, there's nothing, nothing matters. Everything is just sort of uh, empty in the worst sense of the word, you know, and, and I, you know, I've always loved the sense of the teaching of like slicing right down the middle and avoiding all of those extremes. And I think, uh, to understand the path of freedom, not as indulgence or over asceticism, but a path of awareness and compassion is is a great leap. Okay. Um, uh, just final two questions, Sharon. Uh, a personal one, actually. How do you think being a woman has helped or hindered you in becoming established? They said that there is... Surely more pressure on on women, uh, perhaps especially in the U U.S. in in public eye, to pr promote themselves in a in an overtly glamorous way. Um, has has this been challenging? No, I mean I think uh, my life in the um, practice was one where I never had less access or less ability to have the finest teachers and the finest teaching and. When I came back, I was teaching with, you know, Joseph and Jack, as you said, and, yeah. uh, you know, we, we really formed a very supportive community. And uh, if anything, you know, it was, um, you know, I, for example, was terrified of public speaking when we first started teaching and I could not give any of the discourses or any of the talks. And people would often say, blame Joseph and like, you know, why are you holding your back? You know, why won't you let her have a voice? And. 
he would say, I would love for her to give a talk and I get her a night off, you know, it's not because <laughs> she's a woman and she's being held back. It's, it's, uh, she won't do it, which it was true. I had to go through a lot of change before I was not so scared, but you know, and people, uh, I have one friend who was uh, like a colleague, a woman who was saying the things that people kept thanking her for, they'd say, thank you for being so human and thank you for being a woman. And she said, those are the two things she didn't have to prepare at all. And she spent a lot of time preparing, you know, so anything it's, it's been almost the opposite. Like people are so grateful. Women are so grateful that, you know, the number of women that it's like, but wait, I also know some things, you know, like it's not just that. Yeah. Oh, that's really encouraging. Okay. Um, and my, my last question uh, if people wanted to find out more about your work, how, how would they go about it? Well, I have a website at SharonSalzberg.com. It's very easy. It's got a calendar page with my schedule. It's got articles and, you know, podcasts, a bunch of things. I'm sure a link to this will go up. Oh, definitely, yeah. Well, it's been great talking to you um, this afternoon, Sharon. Uh, uh, and a real pleasure. And uh, hopefully, well, I think people who know a bit about the practice of loving kindness will have got a bit more of an idea about it and for anyone that's new to it uh, hopefully it'll give them a bit of a start great thank you so much you can find out more about middle way philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org <laughs>